Hello, this is Terry Norrington from Transform Worldwide Ministries. And this week we are looking at Romans chapter 12. As usual, we will look at some of the passages followed by uh, commentary. So first we start off with verses 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So the first 11 chapters of Paul's letter to the Romans focus primarily on doctrinal issues whilst the latter part of the letter now focuses on practical application. Paul starts off chapter 12 by urging his brothers and sisters in Christ to offer their bodies as a living sacrifice. This may have been perplexing to the Jewish readers of his letter, who would associate sacrifice as the killing and offering of animals to God. But Paul is beseeching the readers to offer themselves as a living sacrifice. So what does that, this mean in practice? In short, it is offering our lives to the service of God through his son, Jesus Christ. Through our acceptance of Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we have given up a life of self. That old life is dead, our sacrifice to him. Now we have a new life, born again in joyous service to him. We live to please God. Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come out, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Living a life of God following the path of Jesus Christ will not be easy. We are required to follow the path through the narrow gate. We do not conform to the pattern of the world where the world travels through a wide gate. The pattern of the world is to make life comfortable for oneself. The life in Christ is to love one another, serving one another. In Mark chapter 10, we read, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom to many. Jesus came to serve and not be served, and likewise we must do the same. We may not literally be give, called to give up our physical lives, although some have lost their lives in serving Christ, but we give our lives in service to God, acting as the hands and feet of Jesus <coughs> here on earth. Verses 3 to 8. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us have has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So what are your gifts? What can you bring to the one body that is Christ? We can think of these, these without being boastful. Indeed, Paul is telling us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. 
but we can be self-aware and we must also not lack self-confidence in the things we can do. Otherwise, we won't use our gifts and the body of Christ will be the worst for it. How willing are Christians to be part of that one body of Christ? How willing are they? Are the varying Christian ministries un, uh, unified for the church? Many ministries can be very protective of the work, and this can be, a, be for a variety of reasons. Coming together in unity as one church doesn't figure in the way that they do ministry. It could be that the lead, leader's status is at stake or fear that the leader may lose out on some income. Others see the differences in doctrine as a big obstacle. The last report that I read suggested that there are over 41,000 Christian denominations globally. And it's been suggested that about 75% all think they are right. And their differences get in the way of unity. But we all believe in Jesus. He should be what unites us, bringing us together in one common cause to make disciples throughout the nations. And we can all have a part to play in that common goal, whether it be welcoming at the doors of our churches on our days of worship and serving refreshments, or whether it be the bigger gifts like leadership. Paul tells us to recognise our gifts, yes, with the moderation of humility, but to use those gifts for the betterment of the body of Christ. Prophecy, prophesy if your gift is prophecy, teach if your gift lies in teaching, serve if your gift is one of serving, encourage if your gift is one of encouragement. The list can go on, but the point that Paul was making is that we all have a role in the one body. 9 to 13. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another uh, one another above yourselves. Never la be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual further serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Paul tells us to hate what is evil. And, and this is what we should indeed do. Evil is all around us. Satan operates in this in this world. Sometimes his work seems obvious. And at other times he can be very subtle. He can be very good at describing evil good, a wolf in sheep's clothing. How can we recognise if this is indeed the case? How can we tell if what is being put before us is God's work or Satan's? Praying is always the best place to start. Praying for the guidance of the Holy Spirit will put us in the right God space to see what comes along. It can take patience and a waiting on God. And if someone is pressuring us into making a quick decision, then this is, isn't likely to be coming from God. Ultimately, taking the right path will lead to a sense of peace. The Holy Spirit will give us peace when we are doing the right thing. And another good test is to see if what is being presented is scriptural. Can we gain some guidance through the Bible, through God's word? If we cannot see anything biblical about the situation, then it is unlikely to come from God. But a word of warning, Satan knows scripture. In Matthew 4, Jesus is in the wilderness and Satan tempts him. And in verse 6, he, he quoted scripture. If you are the son of God, he says, throw yourselves down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. This comes from Psalm 91. So even if the Bible is confirming something good, it still pays to observe the first test, to pray over it, seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Some of us may be aware of the, me the message, hate the sin, love the si sinner. People may do things that are obviously evil and we cannot support their actions, but we can still love the person. God loves that person and deeply wants them to turn to him. Our act of love is to shine the love of Jesus Christ and tell that person about Jesus. For someone to find a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, 
it will alter their lives drastically and give them an honest desire to do good and not evil. And the Apostle Paul continues to tell us how to demonstrate love by being devoted to one another and honouring each other. Wherever possible, practice hospitality. Fourteen to sixteen. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Verse 14 of today's passage starts off with, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Jesus tells us in his Sermon of the, on the Mount that can be found in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. To be happy when people insult us and persecute us goes totally against human nature. If we are hurt, then we are going to want the, the, the abuser to feel our pain. We naturally want to seek revenge. Bless and do not curse is such a hard notion to align with. But fighting evil with evil just adds fuel to a fire. The fire continues to burn and if we add even more fuel, if our reaction is disproportionate, then the fire can burn even more fiercely. By placing blessings onto our persecutors, it will be akin to pouring water on the fire, starving it of oxygen. It takes, takes serious amounts of self-control not to retaliate and to smile sweetly, but it is one sure way to placate an abusive situation. Paul goes on to tell us to rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, and live in harmony with one another. It is joyous to celebrate the victories of others, and it also takes a great virtue of empathy to mourn when others mourn. We can feel their grief as we walk alongside them. And how great it will be when the whole world is at peace with each other, living in harmony with one another. This is not to say that we shouldn't stand, out against, stand up against what is wrong, what is evil, but we can do so in a loving way, blessing and not cursing. And we are so proud that we cannot, and are we so proud that we cannot associate with the lowly, lowly? Paul tells us not to be conceited. We should be able to connect with kings and vagabonds alike. 17 to 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In Exodus 21, we read, but if there is serious injury, you are to, to take life, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Yet Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 tells us something different. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue, sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Whilst not a Christian, we can take heed of the wisdom of the great Indian leader Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi, who said, an eye for an eye makes a whole world blind. And let's face it, the world is spiritually blind is full of self, people looking after number one, wanting instant gratification. And when people get hurt in one way or another, pride steps in 
wanting revenge and justice. Evil repays evil. The Apostle Paul is telling us to feed our hungry enemy, give water to our thirsty abuser. This is the act of, uh, of love that God wants, um, wants us to show because it is the same love that God himself has for everyone. By glorifying God through acts of kindness to those that persecute us, it shames them into realising their own wrongdoings. It extinguishes the fire. I've related the story before, but it still serves to demonstrate the point. Back in the days when the Ku Klux Klan were at the height of their activities in America, a black church was burnt down. The arson attack was led by Johnny Lee Clary. The leader of the church, the Reverend Wade Watts, met Johnny Lee Clary at a radio interview some time later, and the Reverend declared to Johnny that there is nothing you can do to make me hate you. What an amazing, loving thing to say. Consequently, with these words reverberating around his head, Johnny Lee Clary turned to Christ and became a great evangelist. And he and the Reverend Wade Watts became good friends. We should not be the judge of our enemy because we can never know what drives people to do the things they do. Hurting people hurt people. If someone has hurt us, Show kindness and love to them. If there is any judgment to be made, let God be that judge. So let us pray. Father, help our hearts to grow ever loving towards our enemies. May we shine your love at all times and in all circumstances. Amen. <laughs>